Hungary. As I understand it, the primary issue at that time was skepticism about the reported speed results in various countries. These results, frankly, often fail to live up to the expectations that were advertised. I haven't seen the full details of the polygon tests, so I can't comment on their stability or accuracy. It became clear that in our country and in the West, there was no enthusiasm for pursuing this extreme speed, despite promises of reaching 1700 meters per second. I found out that nowhere did they achieve this speed. The British managed about 3000 feet per second for a light bullet, if I recall correctly. The speeds were 888 meters a second for a heavy bullet and around 1100 for a light one. The Americans, it seems, almost reached these peak speeds of 1700 meters per second, according to the data I found. On our polygon, the maximum was around 1300 meters per second, which is, on one hand, an impressive result. We must consider that conical bullets and barrels even then demonstrated low stability and survivability of results, especially in the 1930s. Americans released the first serial swift cartridge in that era, achieving a fairly stable speed of around 1200 meters per second. People experimented with very high-speed bullets and very rifles, and nastiest results with these ultra-high-speed bullets were notable. The developers decided to abandon high-speed models and instead focus on refining classic designs, leading to the development of the VSR. This approach was dominant before the war, with projects like Schwetz, akin to a Soviet magnum, garnering interest from high-level commissioners. The project's appeal was not only in its power, but also in its utility for aviation, especially in high-speed fields, which are crucial. This meant uh, achieving significant penetration, especially as aircraft started to incorporate more armor, changing the dynamics of air combat. A key advantage here is the longer flight range of the bullet and the reduced lead time needed to target, which is critically important for pilots in the dynamic and rapidly changing context of air combat, particularly during wartime. This was the focus of the BNS project. In this sector, this project was known as GNS, an armored personnel carrier named BNS, aimed at achieving high initial speeds. The approach involved traditional methods, like increasing the powder charge volume, for instance, seen in the notable Potter project with its 20mm projectile, quickly adapted to a 40 caliber casing. The visual impact of this was quite striking, as you can imagine. They were also forced back into older concepts, not just in military applications, as exemplified by Lyadov's project, which extended beyond purely military uses. In my archives, one of my favorite projects is from an engineer named Liadov, a third-rank officer who brought forward an anti-tank rifle with high-speed capabilities. Before we continue, let's briefly touch on the proposals of Al. Gentlemen, it's important to note that the initial speed was estimated at 3,400 meters per second, as Liadov had indicated. He also estimated that the above data was only received as a result of gross mistakes which is why all in the project's political aspect is a sad misunderstanding. This often happens when on paper you can count anything, I always say. And the more I work in the industry, the more I realize it's a big mountain to climb, and I remain quite skeptical yet calm. I treat theoretical calculations as mere starting points for tests, which I believe need to be confirmed multiple times. Only repeated experiments can truly confirm or verify something, okay? Moving further along the timeline, it probably makes sense to mention around 1943 or 1944 in Germany. Everyone knows about the V1 and V2, but there was also a V3, which is very relevant to today's conversation. Let's discuss the Gerlich guns in World War II. Now, to wrap up the topic of conical designs, Gerlich's work was not entirely forgotten in Germany. His assistants continued his work and his influence persisted. Germany, during the Second World War, became one of the leaders in producing various conical barrels, as we see in the famous uh, German heavy armored personnel carrier Konica, which, although not mass produced, uh, was used in a way similar to the British project. Interestingly, a uh, Czechoslovakian design if I remember correctly, uh, Frantisek Janicek brought significant innovations. He worked diligently on gear ideas and developed an attachment for their 40mm gun, which allowed for achieving a higher initial speed. In general, considering all factors, these developments were quite significant in terms of technological progress. The conical table and shelves 
required quite a bit of scarce metal king conical. It was more like a, a series aiming to uh, pick with the interest of our potential enemy in this manner. This approach could inflict the greatest damage. However, it should be fairly noted that guns of the poor were actually used by both sides. The British had these guns, as far as I know, as an option for both armor and the Germans on some light armored vehicles. Hands of War Thunder may find this particularly interesting. At least this technique, by the way, should be discussed more like the part. Andre could be invited as a sort of support. Yes, but nevertheless, we can say that we presented especially interesting ones. If I remember correctly, Rabin wrote that we looked at it, studied it, even drew several projects, estimated all the costs and so on, and decided to engage in the classical scheme of accelerating projectiles, but with multi-chamber designs. Indeed, everything was more interesting, not only in the West. Let's talk about how it was in the USSR right after the war. There was also a funny story. Well, again, Genos and Hitler. Genos and Hitler, EK, I don't know if he can be mentioned in a modern YouTube. He was also sick of this old firewood case and wanted to create something ingenious, a product of the German engineering genius, some kind of super weapon that could change the history of the war. Well, everyone knows the V1. These are the first missiles, say, but in essence, these are such drones. That's why such drones are now very actively used. Rockets are also quite an interesting topic. I have seen them internally to put it in command apparatus. That is, when its trajectory was even before the advent of computers at the mechanical level. There was a clock running that essentially counted down. For a certain time, it changed course. Then again, making it absolutely autonomous in mechanical mode, which meant along its trajectory, there was a fast V2 in advance. Matt, let's say Von Braun, the progenitor of all subsequent space programs for many countries, influenced both the Soviet and the American school. This was pure artillery, no longer connected with rocket science. The main idea was, as usual, shelling from large distances across Great Britain and various territories on the continent, by the way. We didn't mention, but during the First World War, these Dora guns and how they profited from them, the Paris gun were used, trains were driven up, fired at Paris over crazy distances, quite a different thing. Paris was fired upon by one cannon, Dora. This was one of Forer's favorite projects, a super heavy artillery scheme, caliber 800 millimeters. It had a quite specific purpose. These were weapons for shelling and destruction of fortifications like the first Maginot line. The Germans relied on these to quickly break through, which the French couldn't counter. However, in the end, they approached. We just went to several places and Dora didn't really come in handy. So, returning to the V3, the point was that these were essentially stationary guns which no one carried anywhere. According to historical data, about 50 installations have been created with a background in the Netherlands. They were actually used and even carried out some shelling in Great Britain. But in my opinion, they didn't manage to cause major destruction because British intelligence in 1944 didn't sit idly by and was able to safely blow it all to pieces and ashes. So that's what V3 was like. It's crazy. Crazy in places a long artillery barrel that was laid on an inclined surface, dialed at a certain angle. There was a whole fortification system and the system was designed so that it was all fast and it just used this idea of multi-chambers, where several were, to speak, next to each other. They tried to synchronize not just mechanically but also electromechanically. What can you add? No, to this I didn't give it, I just wanted to add exactly how this happened in the US. Um, especially after the war, we forgot to mention the lower thinner smoke pipe. Well, we also had something on the topic of multi-channel, which was implemented just after the war, and it started during the war. I mentioned earlier the war project of engineer Lyado. See, the leg chamber, but the future was more in accuracy. There would be a lot of, in fact, projects, but from those that came across in the archives, it was proposed at the end of 1942 by the head of the Department of External Ballistics of the Art Academy, which we are now. Once they remembered in our videos, the engineer Colonel Blacktoad, such a person, like you're an engineer already beyond your rank, especially since the project set is more or less worked out. But there was a war outside, and there was a comrade, an engineer Colonel, who was engaged in a peculiar project requiring the use of experimental laboratories to produce some unusual things to be done at special times. But everyone dismissed him, even the office that sent him. There was a kind of makeshift setup. 
formerly with prisoners working there, but that didn't stop them from discussing top-secret important projects. You are just an engineer colonel, they said, and as a result, your second command PIDR was only able to start after the war. I turned out you could achieve good speed, but at the time, few were interested because there were grenade launchers with cumulative charges. The author discovered a very unpleasant thing. So what practical use was there in this? Obviously not much, and this topic seemed to be a lot for the team. The PTSD project died safely in the West before watching it in German as well, and Fallout 3 got interested in this. The period of the Second World War ends, and the next time it opens is already in the 50s and early 60s, during my student and youth years. I came across a book on ballistics by Mikhailovich Serebro from old sources. He's a lot of silversmiths, a legendary figure in the field of ballistics as a science. He taught and began his career at the Mikhailovsky Artillery Academy. If I'm not mistaken, it was under the Tsar before the revolution and later as an art censor in St. Petersburg. Sorry, it could be Moscow, I might be wrong, but he authored a book that anyone can easily find on the internet. I think I'll show here a picture, so to speak. It was called Internal Ballistics of Barrel Systems and Powder Rockets. In the Soviet Union there were several reissues and an issue from 62, at least the year 60, it is marked or noted, that it provides an article about ultra-high speeds, the ability to reach speeds of the order of 3 to 5 kilometers per second. At the same time, no matter how much I searched, I couldn't find any confirmation that such installations were manufactured other than by theoretical researchers in the Soviet Union. We only find theoretical discussions from refers to the works of Russia in their mind. I will write this here in English for anyone who is interested in looking for sources. Their research dates back to the year 57. On the one hand they were ahead, that is, we didn't invent anything new, the palm remains with them. But I want to draw attention to how quickly and efficiently information from foreign sources was integrated into Soviet textbooks. This is significant. This is the one I'm talking about in example, when military technical intelligence communications worked magnificently. You can take off your hat to them instantly when something significant appeared in the world. This information was collected, analyzed, and effectively disseminated, so to speak, from everything. The unsubscribe was there on the railing gold, which was then transferred to educational institutions in the defense industry. Take and pick up Lexus. I that? In fact, I can't speak again specifically about the head of technical intelligence here and uh, even more about its speed, but uh, as a person who worked with archives, I can say that besides Soviet rifle specialists, not all of them are at the same training ground. They very closely followed the publications of the American open press and in particular, for example, so when I read the project of the Maine Carbine 42, it cited an article from the American magazines as justification, literally on the eve of which were published about what later became the Kumone Carbine volume. Publication reports during the competition at that time were listed, not the winning sample, but it is just something that the Americans held such a competition, this is a very interesting topic and we need to discuss it. Except when again in 1945 we conducted experiments with 9 by 18 fields, which would then potentially become the Makarov pistol. Namely, the rationale for the quality of the literature is evident in this list, which includes most of the titles of English language articles remembered by Melvin Jones and others as documented here. These were so significant for American gunsmiths, which is why I can say exactly what the American approach in the open press was observed very carefully and was absolutely not shy about borrowing. I will add from myself here, gentlemen, that the car bills in Lebanon were quite handsome, as I mentioned earlier. Their publication was in 1950 in the well-known English journal, the Journal of Applied Physics. Additionally, there was another article about JJ's judgment on this and the placenta, also published in this scientific journal. It's important to note that these journals were all available in open sources. Generally speaking, open sources are really great. They were very actively studied at that time. One example that haunts me is the story of Ethan Petrov, who visited the USA in the 1930s. 
As a result of their visit, they became travel journalists and published a book titled One Story America. I highly recommend this book to anyone interested. It's still really wonderful. Inspired by this book and based on an old One Story America poster, Lord and even Ergen modernized the concept and reshot their version of One Story America. That's the story I'm talking about, which is neither a confirmation nor a refutation of the original, but rather a unique perspective on it. I came across old buildings in One Story America obscured by foliage. Among numerous photographs, my attention was caught by illustrations showing a bookstore. This bookstore displayed various Thomas periodicals, reminiscent of your youth technologies and similar youth applications. It was a fascinating discovery, which was borrowed from my point of view from them. Americans have publications like Popular Mechanics and Popular Physics, featuring various books on these topics, with some even showcasing a close-up of a boat on the cover, or perhaps strange underwater floats or hydrofloats. Following the printing of One Story Americas in the Soviet Union, complete with all these illustrations, our renowned designer Alexiev, then a young engineer, became captivated by hydrofoils. He began to effectively develop this technology, transforming it into what it is today. This intellectual pursuit, in my view, seriously pushed the boundaries of innovation. This period, as it were, represents a chic topic for discussion, but it contributed to this push. I apologize if I seem to be taking too much on myself. Nothing I actually wanted to add. In my opinion, of course, that's the period. In my opinion, the period that really interests me is the 1930s and 40s. During this time, direct executors and developers had the opportunity to familiarize themselves with American periodicals. This exposure was highly productive, especially in terms of borrowing the right ideas. It's challenging for me to assess the later times, say the 60s and 70s. During these times, there was an indirect tightening of the screws on accessing Western literature directly. This leads to the question, why did the performers stop delivering literature that was directly commissioned by them? Perhaps some found valuable materials in secret libraries, which then began to be exclusively completed. This was essentially an exercise in technical intelligence. As a result, some aspects have deteriorated. There's no denying that. For example, the entire line of Soviet underwater weapons, including the underwater version of the American hero Jetta, largely emerged from these efforts. I believe if the specialist in Septon could have collaborated, it would have revealed that the United States at that time was intensely focused on this rocket pistol. Failure efforts, which were more like scribbles and stillborn projects, didn't require as much investment, but at least they set a foundation for us. The decision was made that we absolutely needed to catch up and overtake. Now, we are in possession of unique samples, yet these underwater weapons don't seem to garner much interest. From my perspective, the question differs because the market is quite small. In this realm, tactics often defeat technology as the principle of the approach is simple. Communicating from a military mentality, the primary task is to detect the presence of underwater subalters or reconnaissance groups. Once detected, it is likely that special types of weapons, which are extremely efficient at this task, will be employed. Notable instances occurred in the 80s when Soviet ships were blown up in Africa. During my time there, some of our veterans got involved when thieves saboteurs targeted our ships. I recall a foreman with two grenades, sitting alert. Beside him, two fighters were preparing the grenades, twisting the fuses before he threw them over. This happened every two minutes, a routine they followed precisely during that summer. This was their way of responding to the sabotage. A vivid memory of the immediate and practical countermeasures taken in such critical situations. It's clear that in case and not all details can be openly discussed, even in private they couldn't recall any reliable instances of using underwater weapons in combat, not even in scenarios involving threats like shark. This aligns with discussions I've had with Western experts. Although I'm not directly involved, I can imagine the challenges such as conducting nocturnal operations on water where visibility is poor in such cases, one must be prepared to use specialized underwater equipment and possibly employ tactics akin to horse sports 
where understanding the water's nature is key. Before discussing this topic, I'd like to extend a hello to my old friend from the 17th Special Forces Brigade. This brigade, located in Oshakovo, internally worked alongside the herd of Sajikov Island during the Soviet period. It was the only Special Forces Brigade dedicated to special reconnaissance of the fleet. Unlike other smaller separate posts, this brigade had significant presence. I remember a unique incident that occurred in the warm sea, reminiscent of a scene from the James Bond movie, but without the dramatic skirmishes. Our brigade once unexpectedly encountered another undertow group. Despite being only about 50 meters apart, the encounter was quite transparent and peaceful. Each group, aware of the degree of responsibility and their assigned tasks, acted quietly and discreetly. They acknowledged each other's presence, but chose to go their separate ways without any conflict or negotiations, each determined to follow their distinct courses. Let's go into the underwater world with the kids and save the discussion about weapons for later. While I understand the viewer's desire for realism, our current focus shifts back to Jerry Bull. Let's first learn about him in popular youth technology literature. We also explore the Soviet Kremona and the conception of Gerald Bulo's Super Guns Fund. My back is adorned with one of these Super Guns, a testament to its standing here thanks to the Second World War. Without the war, such allocation of funds to a ballistics doctor might not have progressed beyond battleship guns. These are quite expensive, but the United States was where significant advancements were discovered, like finding a single crucial kick. You can probably understand what Jerry did with them and his involvement. Well, I guess the gist of it is about the 60s, a period those proud of Grandfather Ming might recall. 1961 was a landmark year when Senior Lieutenant Gagarin the first person to fly into space, returned as a major even skipping the rank of captain. This was a legendary event, creating a global storm and leaving everyone in shock. It was the first time a person went into space and returned, something previously unheard of. This happened before my time, just like when the first Soviet satellite Sputnik 1 was launched followed by Squirrel and Strelka. That era was marked by intense noise from the active space exploration race with different countries eagerly participating. The space race, while often portrayed as propaganda, was approached with serious practicality in the States. Yes, among all the objects currently in orbit, a small percentage host humans, most are technical satellites, communications, satellites, research probes, and so on. At that time, the t methods of launching the space were not absolutely clear. There was a struggle between two alternative technologies. One school advocated for rocket launches, while the other argued that it wasn't logical to send fuel up there, as the fuel itself would consume resources. They proposed compressing all the fuel here on Earth, reasoning that bullets could be launched into space in line with an alternative artillery system different from conventional rocketry. This approach was reminiscent of the ideas of Jules Verne and Dr. Wright. Indeed, proponents of this scheme were involved in a joint American-Canadian project, a high-level research endeavor, if I'm not mistaken. The program was akin to a high-altitude research project, but it diverged in several directions. This included not only space exploration efforts to reach space, but also research into the upper atmosphere critical for ultra-high altitude aviation. We must remember reconnaissance and aircraft like the U-2. This period, followed by the development of the Blackbird, was a direct result of these studies. At that time, there was a lack of understanding about the upper atmosphere, its composition, behavior, and how it looked from above. There were several platforms for these research activities, so strategically located. In the United States, the northernmost territories were along the border with Canada, while in Kansas, initiatives from the southern states were underway. The southernmost installation was positioned as close to the equator as possible utilizing the Earth's rotation to its maximum advantage. These efforts began around 1961-62, marking a significant era in high altitude and space. The big delay was due to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was suspended for a moment. No one knew what would happen next. It was on the threshold of the Third World War, and generally, science was not the main focus. But when the problem was resolved, they quickly returned to the project. It was very effective. Launches could be done at one-hour intervals, allowing a large number of small research satellites to be launched. This was the cheapest launch option, 
budget space, reaching up planeticum was not expensive. They succeeded in consistently accelerating the projectiles. They managed to send their object to a height of up to 180 kilometers. This was one of the greatest heights achieved by the project, which was quite successful. These were the lengths of the barrel guns developed for the project. The cannon behind you is just from this project as seen in the photos and videos. The body of the barrel was not quite cylindrical, with stiffening ribs on the outside. An interesting engineering scheme. The project developed probably until the middle, maybe until the end of the 60s. Then the project began to lose interest. First, the Canadians left it. Various military departments gradually started to draw away from it. Eventually, the project was shelved, although the results were quite significant. According to the results collected, it turned out to be bold, but as far as I know, it didn't work. The tender will probably tell you that it surfaced again at another time in a different place. First, let's return to it about this project. The principle of what gave birth to you will kill you play the role. This project itself was able to thrive thanks to scientific and technological progress after World War II. There was a huge advancement in electronics, although not modern by today's standards. There was also significant progress, gunpowder. Such a project in the late 30s wouldn't have been feasible. The appropriate technologies for unlimited funding did not exist. They appeared later. Because of these technologies, precision sensors were developed. The artillery method of launching projectiles into space had its limitations. The first ones were associated with huge overload, which tested the projectile delivery. Really speaking, you wouldn't send a person in this way. You couldn't just pack someone against a mountain as it wouldn't work. This project was killed by its limitations despite its initial success. How does it simply smear it when fired in the walls of the capsule? Moreover, the electronics of that time, in principle, would not have survived the intense acceleration required for orbital launch. Yet, it was theoretically possible to achieve orbit in this manner. The fact that it could withstand such acceleration made it a point of interest. However, from a practical military perspective, it didn't fare particularly well. At high technology, it was feasible to create and supply an orbit station, nearly launching a spy uh, satellite capable of flying over the Soviet Union and recording necessary data would have been beneficial. However, deploying such a spy satellite was impractical due to the fragility of electronics at the time, which would disintegrate upon firing. As a result, the project was gradually phased out until the theoretical possibility of orbital shooting was proven. Though the results were obtained, they did not significantly contribute from the military's perspective at that time, leading to the system. Consequently, Dr. Wu found himself out of a job. This situation highlights the complexities and challenges of pioneering space technology during that period. If a ballistician of such early significance, like a Lee, would not remain completely idle, then his work would likely surface in various countries, specifically South Africa assisted making their wonderful Kushka, but the end of this collaboration was quite tragic. He found himself on a downward path and became involved with Saddam Hussein, who at that time had not yet become the infamous figure known to the world. The world community was seeking peace. Yet the long dragging conflict was still ongoing, making him somewhat of a persona non grata, as described. In Soviet political news, I was constantly feared between the horns of the Iran issue, where there was a persistent Iranian line. The situation was tense, with the garden casting a wary eye towards Israel while opposition mounted against the Arab nations surrounding it. There emerged the theory that his hiring was not merely for artillery improvement but to construct a super command gun. This weapon could potentially shell not just neighboring Iraq but also Israel's territory, a prospect that was met with disfavor by the Israelis. This scenario is one of the speculated versions in Dr. Bulo's mysterious death seemed to underscore. He was found dead at the apartment post that seemingly pushed in and shot with Thomas as a potential suspect. Though Thomas was known for such bold actions, realistically, almost anyone opposed to Iraq possessing a super gun could have been responsible. If such a project existed, it would have been significant. The Iraq Y had started ordering very peculiar precision Russian pipes, seemingly unsuitable for the oil industry, but perfect 
for a super gun. What would be such a project if it existed? There are several data charts. The only I request started to order this is a very strange precision machine pipe. Pipes with a diameter of a meter were clearly not required for the oil industry. They were instead perfectly suited for the barrel of this super gun. He might be able to provide concrete details years later. The classification of the archives of the special service involved in this matter will reveal what truly transpired. This topic has been explored in several films, including Western ones. Bureaucrats, not necessarily American and without obvious reason, have put a brake on the progress, limiting the pipes and such. They have yet to fully disclose their reasons to the press. There is a preference for secrecy likely because they had precise information about the intended use of these pipes. Tragically, the situation ended badly for him.